you want to come for a ride? No. I'm going to walk. Thank you. Well, do you want to come with us? Welcome to LMM Drives. And this is, in fact, the first bus that I have ever driven. And I think it's made slightly more terrifying by the fact that this is a double-decker. And to me, double-decker buses have always seemed just a trifle unstable. The fact that it's basically taller than it is wide. We've all seen the Top Gear episodes where Jeremy Clarkson builds himself a high car and it's all wobbly. And that's how I feel about one of these buses. It's just all wobbly. And I find that a little bit weird. It's also a really, really strange seating position for me. I'm used to driving large vehicles, but when I'm normally in a large vehicle, I'm sat at least where my head is now. Not to be almost on the ground, it's, it's really quite strange. I love being at the front of a vehicle like this. This is something that's always really kind of, I like being right there and having nothing in front of me. But I just constantly feel like I'm about to bottom out. And frankly, that's terrifying. It's also, every time we hit this bump in the road, the whole thing sways. And every single time, I think we're about to fall over. As scary as it feels as we tilt to one side, these things won't actually fall over until they go over 45 degrees. Or at least that's what they tell me. I'm inclined not to believe it, because it certainly doesn't feel that way. big thing here. This is a Leyland Olympian bus. And the first thing to take from it is it's actually quite large. I think this may be the biggest thing we've actually featured that goes on the road so far on the channel. And not on a railway, yeah. Yeah, this is of railway sizes. This is actually bigger than my own big vehicle. I think Jupiter. in terms of dimensions, the only way you're ever going to get bigger than this is if they let you drive a mining dump truck, which um, oh, I would love that. I think that's the only way we get bigger than this. Yeah, and you can't even take those on the road. Well, I mean... Who's going to stop you? The army, I guess. <laughs> now, this particular bus is one of the earlier of the, of the class, being built in 1982. And they were designed in 1979 and then unveiled in 1980. Yeah, commercial at, motorcycle. At commercial, exactly. Yeah. And then they went into production later that year and started rolling out. And the weird thing about this is normally when people say British Leyland, everybody panics and goes, oh God, it's going to be terrible. But amazingly, these sold surprisingly well because, well, they're probably one of the most iconic and probably the best vehicle that Leyland ever produced. This is a good vehicle from British Leyland. Yeah. And I know, shock and horror, because they don't really normally go together in that order when people say good vehicle and British uh, Leyland. British Leyland, yeah. Unless there's the word not involved yes, somewhere. Yes, exactly. Now, for us, we were thinking about this. This is very much the stereotypical bus. You think of bus and it's this kind of shape and this kind of bus that immediately comes to mind. Very I mean so much so that these are still operating today. This, this bus's sister still does a school route. This only came off the road of doing a route in 2018 before it went into preservation. Which that means that this particular bus here is one of the oldest to kind of still be working yeah. and that it's 1982 sister, to 2018. It's ridiculous for a service life on this but it's sister is still out there and working which gives you an idea of just how good these things are and they were back from that day where things were built to last and Leyland did it right? Yeah this was actually initially based on the Leyland Titan as well but over time people decided they didn't like those anymore because well they were basically built for London and nowhere else in the country wanted anything to do with London, so instead they built these. The big difference being that the Leyland Titan was built as a bus. You bought it yeah. as a bus. These things, these came as basically a chassis, an engine, a gearbox, and then kind of 
a scaffold arrangement yeah. of the Take rest it of to it. a coach builder to do whatever you want with it. So you could tailor this to be absolutely any, well, within reason, I suppose. If you wanted yes. a plush felt interior and shag orange carpet, Velour. you could do that. I don't think anybody did. I think that's the main thing to take from it. I don't think anybody yeah. did, but you could, which means that there are an absolutely insane amount of variations of this because they went all over the country. Now, originally these things, they were built in Bristol at Leyland's plant, but very quickly into production, I think they made a thousand. Then because, you know, Leyland were doing so well financially and nothing was going mm. bad financially nothing. in the country. No, nothing, nothing all was fine. bad at all. For no reason at all, they decided they'll move it up north. Where it was a little bit cheaper to produce them. And they also put it into the factory where they were building their other commercial tractor and building and machiny things. Yeah. And apparently it worked because they did make good vehicles. Now, Leyland's big problem at the time was also one of the big things, you know, they made a rail bus, or basically a bus on railway wheels. On, on railway And yeah. it was just a failure. They spent a lot of money investing into making this thing. And it just- Leyland were very good at spending a lot of money, but not making that much money, weren't they? That's like us, we're good at that as well. Yeah. We are the Leyland of car channels. Oh God. <laughs> so the body of this particular bus was built by a company called Charles Row of Crossgates, which is, I believe, somewhere near Leeds. And it went on to work with the West Yorkshire PTE for about eight years. PTE, if you're unaware, is Public Transport Executive. Now, this is where things get a little bit interesting because the buses weren't sold went to this company. They were on lease hire. And when things happened as they do and the transport changed hands again, the new one, Yorkshire Rider, had this one flight here of they were spending a lot of money hiring these buses. And they thought they could possibly get it a bit cheaper by just playing the system a little bit. So they thought, we'll send these back to Leyland so we don't want your buses. And Leyland would go, oh no, we need to sell these cheaply, quickly at auction to make some money. Unfortunately for them, these were good buses and Leyland were like, well, okay, we'll give them to the next guy. So um, unfortunately, they kind of got a bit stuffed and didn't get nearly the amount of buses they wanted. They asked for 20 and how many they wind up They with? had 20 on lease hire. Yep. They went back at auction, they managed to buy four. <laughs> yeah, and everyone else got the rest, so they were left rather short staff. But that does kind of reiterate the point how good these were. People did actually want these buses. I mean, later on, when Leyland were taken over by Volvo, they still basically made Olympians. You had Volvo Olympians yeah, instead, which was entirely different in every way, apart from the chassis was the same shape. Based on Volvo's reputation, you would have thought that they probably made a machine built on the success of this and made it made better. Made for harsh Scandinavian winters with salt gritted roads. Yes. No, they made the chassis worse than Leyland did. The, these, Somehow. at this generation, when Leyland built them, have a good reputation. When Volvo made them, they have a reputation of falling apart. So somewhere, the wires got crossed. Yeah. <laughs> Leyland made a good thing, Volvo didn't. It must have been opposite day when this was designed <laughs> in the 79, mustn't it? things about driving a bus is that people get out of your way in the same way that they tend to get out of the way of my fire engine. And I'm not sure if that's because they recognise the way this thing's being driven in a kind of barreling toward them, oh my god I need to get out of this way, or if it's just something people are more courteous to bus drivers out here. Possibly a mix of the two, not really sure. But it is quite nice to be driving down these roads and people clear a path for you. In terms of actually how this thing's drive, it's really, I'm really enjoying it but it's very, very strange. First of all, the driving wheels are behind me by quite some way. So the amount of overhang at the front, and when you steer, you don't kind of lead, you follow where it's going. You kind of, it's a really strange sensation that's hard to put into words. Again, it's something that I'm used to from my own fire engine, because that's a similar thing, but it's far more pronounced than this. It's far more obvious. This is on airbag suspension, and it does make it, well, it's a comfortable ride, if a slightly, it's akin to being on a boat. That's the best thing I can kind of say for how I feel about driving this. It's like being afloat, but on the tarmac sea. And initially it was terrifying. As we get a little further down my driving, I'm actually starting to relax with it a bit more. Now, the other thing about this, which is really, really strange, and it's repeatedly getting me off guard, is the throttle. The throttle on this is air operated. So when you put your foot down, 
you can hear, if you're not moving, this slight sound of compressed air, followed by a delay of about a second, and after that, then it starts moving. So your initial reaction is to go, oh, nothing's happening, I'll put my foot down harder. And then suddenly, this huge great bus lurches into forward momentum as it wants to go forward. And I'm slowly getting my way around it. It's, it's getting there. The other thing, which is really strange, is this gearbox. Now, the little gear shifter down here is electronic. So if I now take it out of gear and select a new gear, it's now changed up into a new gear, all without me having to use a clutch. The clutch itself is automatic. And then the way this works is it's basically a hydrostatic transmission with a load of bands on it. And when I do this, it disconnects one band and now hydraulic pushes down the next band onto the drive and changes gear. You have to give it a break between the two to allow the first band to release before the next band goes down. Otherwise, effectively, you're going to try and drive it forward in two separate gears. And I'm told by the owner of this vehicle that that is a very easy way to totally ruin a gearbox. The thing about this little gearbox thing here is it's not what these buses were built with originally. Originally, this was fully automatic. And through its various things that it's done in its life, it, at some point, it ended up on the Isle of Man. And they, to its credit, did a big job on restoring it and bringing it back to its former glory. And after it, they'd finished with it, it came back to the mainland and fell into ownership of somebody called Confidence Coaches. And they took it upon themselves to install this little doohickey here. I don't know why they didn't like the automatic gearbox, but this is it. And frankly, once you've got your head around this thinking ahead motion with it, it's actually really nice to use. I really, really think this is cool. I've never used anything like this, but now we just drop it down a gear, flip the throttle, and it's, it's just, it's really nice. The whole sensation of driving this thing is absolutely wonderful. I had absolutely no idea what to expect when I jumped into a bus. I have never driven a bus. The nearest thing I've driven is lorries. And I knew that it wouldn't be like a lorry, but I had no frame of reference. And everything about this is overwhelmingly positive. I absolutely love it. And I've always kind of gone, I'd quite like a bus, but now I really want a bus. Because this thing is, it's great. It's just so much fun to drive. I've just got such a, the inner child in me is just loving every moment of this. It's just great. There's so much class in front of me. I have this huge great windscreen for me to really see everything going on. Unlike an HDV, I don't really feel like I've got any like blind spots. Everything is good visibility. I've got plenty of space over that side where I've got the doors which are glass so I can see what's around there. I've got my mirror there. I mean, admittedly, the mirrors are tiny. That's the biggest thing about this. I have tiny, tiny rear view mirrors, but then they don't need to be any bigger. They show me everything I need to know around my surroundings. Plenty of glass here huge amount of glass there. It's all just lovely. And so for a driving experience and drive around the countryside, this is wonderful. Now, of course, taking it into town would be a totally different thing. And I don't envy the drivers who spend their lives driving around towns, particularly things like London, Leeds, Birmingham, those kind of places, because I think it would be less than enjoyable. And of course, the big thing that I'm lacking in here are any customers. So, I've chosen to sit upstairs in the Olympian for two major reasons, mostly so I can enjoy the lovely view around me, but also so I can keep an eye on Laurie through this little glass down here. Now, upstairs isn't quite as nice as downstairs because, well unfortunately these aren't the original fabrics. Downstairs is what it started its life as, whereas, as you can probably tell by where I'm sat, it's a little bit of a mix up here. But genuinely, it's quite nice. I mean. This is the first real time I've ever been on public transport and not been annoyed because normally when I'm on a bus or a train or anything of the sort, my car or my motorbike is broken, which unfortunately means I'm annoyed and then there's people around me, which just doubles that annoyance up completely. Whereas when you know you have a working vehicle and there's no one around you to annoy you, it's actually an amazing place to be. There's actually one person, which we've been told about since we've been here, who has a bus like this, parked on the cliff just as a lookout point because 
Honestly, when you're up here and it's so flat, it is absolutely stunning views. It's just a really nice way to travel. Now, the fabric that's downstairs is actually what was initially for the transport for London. But being in West Yorkshire, they didn't actually want to be too associated with London, which is why it's got these leather trims around the side. The hodgepodge up here has just come off various other vehicles, so it's a little bit more mismatched, but the seats are relatively comfortable. It is, however, just a little bit rattly, and I think that's mostly rubber trims which have gone on the glass, which is uh, kind of damping the experience down. But although the vehicle's relatively loud downstairs, up here it's kind of subdued with the extra with the extra floor in between. There is one flaw about being up here, though, and that is that the ceiling is um, well, the ceiling is quite tight for someone who's six foot like me. So I do bump my head quite a lot, especially when coming down the stairs. That said, apparently this is the better one to be in because they also did a low roof model for low bridges, which um, it loses a foot off the roof. And as I'm already scraping at six, I imagine I'd have to be on my knees crawling to get to my seats up here. The last years of its life were unfortunately lived out with school children in it, which has rather taken a toll on the interior quality up here. It's not too bad, but um, you can tell where bored children have picked away at paint along the sides. Laurie? Laurie? Uh, watch out for that tree! round corners too fast in a in a double decker bus is the single most terrifying thing i think i've ever done in my life because you go into it thinking forgetting you've got all the mass up there thinking it's a normal vehicle and then as you go in the whole thing lists to the side and you suddenly have this overwhelming sensation of oh i've mucked this up royally and bottom goes tight pretty sure matt's bottom goes tight and the owner just he goes a lighter shade as uh, the look of horror dawns on him. There is one other thing I keep doing, is I keep kind of accidentally going for what I think is the clutch. And what that actually is, the button that opens the doors. And so we just randomly, as we're driving along, have the doors spontaneously open. This brings me on to a lovely thing that this does very well, is this is now the cooling system. If it's a hot day and you're feeling too hot in this effectively greenhouse-like construction, Having the doors open is wonderful. It's nice, it's cooling, and in a lovely day here for bumbling around the backgrounds of Norfolk and Cambridgeshire, this is lovely. I have my doors open. There's not too much wind coming through. I've got the window here as well. It's all just, I don't feel like I'm the king of the road in this. That's not the right sensation, but it's pretty damn good. It's just, it's a wonderful, and I love the sound of the engine. I do like a diesel engine. And this thing is just beautifully smooth. And it, once you've got past that delay, you put your foot down. It just makes this wonderful noise. Everything about this thing is just joyful. I have once or twice got it up to its heady speed of 45 miles an hour. And it is absolutely terrifying. The locals don't seem to agree that 45 miles an hour is a ample speed for this road as I seem to be being overtaken repeatedly. But I don't mind, because I'm just happy being in this thing, trundling about. Driving this around, there is one thing that strikes me. This is certainly a large vehicle, and it's, of course, not of the weight of, say, an HGV lorry that I'm used to driving, but it is comparable to Jupiter. But this doesn't, to me, feel like it has the same weight or mass. The way it drives doesn't feel like a heavy vehicle. Jupiter, you feel very much like 
you are fighting with a very heavy thing and you're aware of its mass in everything that you do. This is just really nice and easy to drive. And apart from the way it sways from side to side, I don't really feel like I'm driving a big heavy vehicle. It doesn't really seem to feel like that. It's deceptive in that way. The brakes too, the brakes are interesting. They're, they're sharp, you have to be very gentle with the brakes and it's a very slow process of putting your foot on. If you just dump your foot on the brakes, this thing will stop. It will just stop and everybody in the back will be thrown forward. Which as fun as it sounds when I've got Matt sat over there, isn't actually ideal. It's, you have to gently, gently feel the brakes and then you feel them bite and then you can gently push them on a little bit more and slowly bring it to a stop. It's a very, it takes used to. That's a, a bit of finesse is needed there, which is not normally my style. The one thing that has amused me, I think more than anything else on this trip so far, is the fact that we currently are showing a Leeds destination board. We are a long way from Leeds and lots of people are getting very confused to why there is a bus saying Leeds driving down one of the most rural parts of the country. It's quite amusing. Rolling our way back to this morning when we turned up, we had to do the prep on this thing. Now, the first thing you'll notice is the logo of Canbus next door to me. This thing has never actually worked for Canbus, but the livery is of confident coaches of where it came from. And the problem with that is they're actually kind of local to where we are now. And I don't know if you know this, but driving around in a bus that is of the same livery as a company that actually operates buses in that area generally doesn't go down very well when you just hurtle past bus stops of people waiting for their bus, generally regarded as a bit of a no-no. Now this little Leviathan weighs just under 10 tonnes at 9,711 kilos. She is just under 10 metres long. And all the way up there, that's 14 foot six. It's quite a substantial box. And much like my own fire engine things that I like, it's built with very few round lines. The only thing round on it are these bits, these windows. You can actually see just how much of a box it is with where it's still joined together by riveted strips. I guess, yeah, I guess these are the panels here and then this must be the, the chassis of the thing and you just have a panel and it goes slap, dunk, 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 dunk. And that works. So, moving this way to prepping the thing. Having got it, now you might think, whoa, you started it. You can't do your checks before it's running. Uh, yes, okay, there's some things we can't do. For instance, in here we have the belts. And I'm meant to check to make sure that all these spinny things are tight. The group has told me that that's fine and I don't need to. So that's fine. We'll just ignore that for now. The reason it's running, however, is that it's a Gardner engine and they like to be hot and warm before you measure anything. Because if not, everything on the dipstick says, nope, we're empty. Then you fill it up, start it, check everything again, and it goes, no, you're over full. So the solution is wait for it to warm up, which means we look in here comes up and that goes like stiff it's heavy and stiff and I wasn't the owner told me that it's heavy and I wasn't quite expecting it to be that heavy this this is the same Gardner engine that goes into a class 03 loco only they have an eight cylinder and this is a six cylinder yeah it's a six LXB which means it's an 11 litre diesel, 600 diesel, and it generates somewhere in the region of 180 horsepower. And it's transverse. I mean, it makes sense because it's in the back, but still, it's just a six cylinder transverse engine. Yeah, I'm, I'm used to these being longitudinal like in a loco, and having it like this is weird. And I really like the fact that there's all these bits moving from the, the pump that's driving the fuel injectors and everything. It's just, it's an old school engine, I like things. So. All I have to do with this is locate a dipstick and confirm that there is in fact some liquid dinosaur on that. Replace that and then I've got the automatic one here. Ah. And again, this has got the black and wet stuff on it as well. And that will go back here. The air release valve went off 
just as I put that in and I panicked momentarily like what have I broken that however completes all I need to do in there there is one other thing we should do oh that caught me totally off guard I wasn't expecting that to be that heavy just around here what we should do is take this off and fill it up with coolant and there is a very technical way to find out how full it is you keep filling until your feet start getting wet at that point it's probably full as it's now been running for a little bit we probably kind of we had a cup of tea and coffee we probably now pressurized the system they checked it before they started it and tell me it's fine but if i take that off now i'll probably get scolded and that probably won't be the best thing to do on this side the first thing they had to done in the morning is open up this and turn the little key in there on which will turn the power on the same way with my truck if you really want you could also fill up the stream wash which is a good idea then as with an hgv before it goes out you need to inspect the tires they're good and then we go over to fuel now as this is an old bus it doesn't have modern things like you know a fuel gauge instead you have to dip the tank so you pop this off and suddenly you're revealed with an anti-siphon tool which means you cannot dip the tank so just to re-elaborate re what's going on in order to find out how much diesel is in the tank you need to dip it but you can't dip the tank so taking this out unless you bring the tank is just a lucky guess who knows you might get to your destination you might not who knows it's all part of the fun of heritage vehicles stupid with that we can go inside and we have the emergency door control if i push this it opens the basic rule is last person out shuts the doors if this control is active or the control that's up here it means that the control on the foot pedal in there won't work which really makes sense doesn't it so moving inside the next things to do are your basic tests for any hgv things like making sure your lights work your indicators your hazards and of course your horn works very important things there is a little fault book behind me stored here where you write your faults so the next guy coming along can see what's wrong with it which you've managed to bodge and hide from your employer so that sits there that's it should go through all of that but it's all basic stuff and you don't need to see me testing indicators coming across here the only other thing that we really need to test is to see if the emergency door works and if i pull this the alarm should go off over down there and now I'll shut that fair enough that means the buzzer is working because uh, if you do open the emergency door the driver kind of needs to know about it apparently killing people by them falling out of the back of your bus is frowned upon in most bus circles having shut the door we can walk back down here one thing to note as well here is these yellow bits of tape at some point this had buttons in there but they've been removed so it's just got tape on it now there's also some other modifications as we have cctv added to this now which it originally didn't have we've got a luggage storage area here and a little luggage storage area there hidden behind here there is a flap with some route indicator boards which are now hidden and then over here we have the most important thing of all this one and this one here these go round and they're not just playthings. no they actually serve a purpose by moving these we can change the bus destination so there's a little view thing up here so i can see what it's saying through that the reflection of it and the same there i pull this little flap down like there open that and now we can see what number we've got this is very important for setting where your bus is going and you can really muck around by people by going somewhere and setting a totally wrong destination i think it's hilarious people who ride the bus don't find it very funny at all welcome to the control center i don't know what you call this place so i'm going to call it the control center this is the operation command center of a bus now there are several things on here some of which you may not recognize this thing for instance in front of me is called a steering wheel and by turning it i can change the direction of where the bus is going i actually really like steering wheels like this i've always liked just these big it's, it's a trucking steering wheel i quite like that oh we've got a tackle on this and as we're now at work i can set it to the work setting because we're filming the layout in here is pretty simple steering wheel here i've got my horn which is a lovely air horn which goes and then indicator on this as well with my hazard just down there as well i've got the controls in front of me here so i can see what's going on if i've told the indicators on i've got air gauges here for the two air tanks i've got a later in its life added uh discharge battery charger reader thing there's a technical name for that and i've forgotten it 
which is there. And then in front of me, I've got this lovely combined speedo and taco unit, which being a taco, on the outside it's in kilometers and on the inside it's miles an hour. So when I first jumped just into this this morning and started driving, my, well, the owner of the bus was kind of looking over my shoulder going, why are you going so slow? I'm doing 30, and no, I was doing 30 kilometers an hour. Then over here we have the third air tank as well. Because this is a super modern vehicle, we have a heated windscreen in the front, which will demiss the front. This is something so modern that I don't even have it on my own vehicles. And then we have the Heister of Resistance, which is the demister, which just makes the most weird noise when it powers off. It's, it's very, very strange. This has also got something a bit weird, as we mentioned earlier as we're driving, which is this weird little semi-automatic gearbox thing. Handbrake is down here. Then we've got wipers here, which, funny enough, operate the wiper at the front. We have headlights, which are on a twisty thing. And then we've got various other lights. We've got the cab lights, fogs, all the things like that. The Tony Offy button, and then just other lights for interior here. One of the key features this bus had is this button behind me that says cleaners. So when the cleaners came in at the end of the day to clean up all the mess that you rabble make, just press the button and turn all the lights on in the bus so they didn't have to fumble around with all the controls around here. There is of course one button on this that I love more than anything else and that's the foot button that opens and shuts the doors. The other buttons we have are the screen wash that makes a noise and these two buttons here which are test buttons which will fire up the systems across here to make sure that everything is working. And that really is it. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the weirdest things is the fact that this is an air throttle. So you push it, you hear a release of air, and then it revs. But there is a foot down, one, two, there is a good second and a bit gap between pressing pedal and it going, which does make it driving it to be rather strange indeed. Things I do like though, are this, you open this, and now I can gesture out at the windows at the motorists who have done something to cut me up. It's just the right height to be able to put your arm out and uh, gesture that you're unhappy with what's happened. It also means that you can drive yourself around like this. The final control that's of any merit is this door that slams shut and will take your fingers off. And now you can assume the driver's position of standing here with your hand on the coin tray thing. Obviously, once upon a time here, we had a board that had prices and things on it, and this is where you put your money, and I've got all my dials here, which instead of currency now, I have things like switches and relays. You may notice behind me here, we have a load of these little, like, buttons. These are all pop-out fuses, so if something dies, it pops out, and you just press it back, and that resets it. Don't have to fix anything, just push it back, and that will fix it. basically it guys we really hope you've enjoyed coming for a ride with us on this well it's a classic bus and the first bus that we've ever bought on yeah. the channel and actually i think the first bus that either of us have been on this millennium yeah probably well you've been on a couple of, i don't think i've actually been on a bus I spent uh, a double over ten, 20 years yeah I, possibly not since i've been able to drive it's been a while yeah so it's been something a bit different it's something that we've enjoyed and if you have enjoyed it then the fine folk behind this thing at Eastern Bus Enthusiasts have a whole host of other vehicles that we could go out from so let us know in the comments if you'd like to see more bus content and if you actually want to see these buses themselves uh, they should actually all be shown at the Fenland Bus Fest and Classic Car Show which is hopefully in July this year they normally have it a bit earlier but Hopefully COVID will be over by then, so come and enjoy some classic buses. Which is well something that we might go to as yeah. well. We might make an appearance, but obviously we'll know. Well, they need to hand driving buses up there, and apparently you're qualified now, so. I can now drive buses. Unfortunately, you might not see this bus there, as it's just been sold to a new owner, who I'm um, not entirely sure if they'll be bringing it to that show or not. I don't think so, because from what I hear, it's going back home. Back up to Leeds, yes. back up north. So it's going back to where it started life all those years ago which is something, well, it's kind of nice, isn't it, to yeah. go back to where it started like. And if you have enjoyed this video starring me and him looking at a classic vehicle, how about clicking over here for the video we did on the Datsun 280ZX. And if you've enjoyed public transportation, how about clicking...
down there for the video we did on a locomotive. Who's new driving? owner? I don't know who's driving it. Maybe it has gone to its new owner. How are we getting home now? When's the next bus? I think that was the last one. Do you know how to read a bus timetable? <laughs>